having our October seminar today, and welcome to our CHIPS Method Seminar. And today we were very fortunate to have one of the founding members of CHIPS. So Tom's been involved in CHIPS ever since the very beginning. And we're equally excited because he's the uh, expert in missing data. So we are very excited to have Tom today, and he'll be talking about joint modeling of incomplete data with diverse variable types using latent variable models. So um, it's a privilege, and uh, I'll turn Thanks. it over to Tom. Well, it's a treat for me. I, of course, this, uh, I, I uh, have presented a handful of times in CHIPS methods seminars, and it's nice to have it be a little in, informal, and so if there are questions along the way, and we can uh, keep it that way. In fact, uh, when you mentioned about the founding of chips I, uh, I can hardly resist sharing some stories a lot of some of the meetings a lot of the meetings were in this room and um, Mary Jane hadn't been at UCLA that long Mary Jane Rotherham uh, who was the uh, founding director but she clearly had this um, uh, you know just a magnetic personality and the you know powerhouse research uh, Portfolio and uh, it, it, and and there was such a need at the time. This was in the um, mid 1990s, and so it was right around the time that um, uh, some of the antiretrovirals were just being the very first one. What was um, the protease? No, but the first. Um, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't even antiretrovirals. It was. I'm blanking on the name of the first one that was uh, in a clinical trial that made it. Uh, through, it had a big survival advantage. And I mean, you know, this, AIDS was like a death sentence in those days. And the, um, um, but the, the cast of characters included this mix of you know, people at UCLA in public health, biostatistics, epidemiology were well represented. Other parts of the UCLA campus, nursing, uh, um, some of the other campus branches. And there were, uh, people from Drew, Eric Bing uh, was involved, and, and people from the city of Los Angeles uh, and, and the uh, uh, county uh, AIDS department. And, and uh, the big issues at the time were um, um, issues of uh, um, like, uh, you know, early detection and trying to um, do, do uh, Testing, but would it be would you be releasing names of people and and uh, those issues were really sensitive at the time. Act up was uh, really active, so it was um, um, so it's always meaningful to me when there's ever a chips activity that it, that I think that part of the story of chips is that um, it's uh, um, you need to somehow synthesize lots of voices and synthesize lots of perspectives and um, uh, this is kind of a corny way to maybe tie into this topic but I, I do think of it so uh, when I got interested in statistics out of really broader interests in public policy but then I saw that health applications were really where the uh, a lot of the activity was and a lot of the professional opportunities would be and so I came to UCLA as a postdoc in 1991 and, and uh, um, got, I got a joint appointment with psychiatry and biobehavioral sciences in 95 so that's actually how I got to know Mary Jane first and it was in the next year that uh, she spearheaded these uh, CHIPS things but the, the CHIPS meetings that led into the formation of CHIPS uh, but I think of um, uh, you know statistics is a discipline with lots of disparate ways to do things. Sometimes you can have more than one way to test the same general question. Sometimes uh, um, you know you have information coming from different places and and uh, I just was I was very privileged in, in graduate school. My advisor was Donald Rubin who developed a lot of the methods for handling missing data, also methods for causal inference uh, in particular in observational studies and so this um, we, we speak of uh, having a missing data perspective or, and thinking of life itself as a missing data problem and thinking of there being uh, um, when, when, you, when you 
think of there being a, kind of an idealized version of a data set uh, that might not even be something that you could ever actually measure. Maybe there's some latent variable, some quantity about a person that you'll never be able to directly measure, but you could think of the values of that as, you know, out there or, or in there if it's, you know, a characteristic of a person and that you could, um, uh, that you could view it as missing data and then somehow make, make progress in, um, uh, in inference. And uh, what I found, my, found in the, my early involvement in the psychiatry department was that you had a lot of studies with not very many subjects and with tons of variables because when you have not very many subjects, you're going to measure everything you possibly could on them. And so you ended up in these problems with, uh, um, they could even have more variables than, than subjects. And, um, and I just, I, I saw that as a, um, as just a, an, an area of ongoing need in, in science. So, uh, so um, I'll keep tying this in. This is a list of some of the collaborators on it. It includes um, Juwan Song, who was uh, here last year in a visiting uh, position. Um, Xiao Zhang Ren He were former graduate students. Shang Lu is finishing up this year. John Buscarden was a faculty member here for a number of years uh, um, and then uh, for family reasons went to UCSF. Um, anyway, general setting, uh, uh, incomplete high dimensional data. High dimensional just means lots of variables. Uh, um, and uh, moderate number of cases, potentially fewer than the number of variables. Uh, with uh, missing values, this could be because uh, of a number of reasons. It could be because um, it's uh, um, a person who would have had to do something in order for you to collect the data and they didn't show up or they didn't do what they were asked to do. They didn't answer a question. Uh, and anytime there's a, a human element to the reason that you don't have data, it's uh, risky to the point of uh, uh, dangerous uh, to assume that the, those people are like a random subsample of everyone else. So uh, part of the challenge in dealing with missing data problems is that there could be a, a degree of self-selection or a degree of, uh, um, uh, you know, just uh, differences among the, the people who you observe and the people who you don't observe. Uh, there could be other reasons, though, for, for missing this. One is that um, maybe the in investigator decided, uh, oh, hey, how are you, Cheryl? Good to see you. Um, uh, maybe the investigator decided uh, that there's a measure that's awfully expensive and that they can't afford to take it on everyone, but you could collect it on a sample basis. And that is a mechanism for generating missing this that at least, so, you know, so some of the time you might, the mechanism might be under your control. But in general, uh, the, uh, that's a concern. Uh, potentially different data types. You know from introductory statistics classes that there are, uh, you know, different body of methods for handling c continuous variables, binary variables, ordinal, categorical, or nominal, categorical variables, uh, um, uh, like race, ethnicity would be a classic nominal variable. Um, a lot of uh, uh, Likert scale questionnaire items or uh, uh, severity items or a lot of quality of life questions, a lot of, you know, mental health questions might be on an ordinal scale. And then you could also have longitudinal structure, which adds uh, to the complexity. Oops, what did I do there? Um, so all, all of this presentation is anchored within the framework of, of uh, multiple imputation, which is an idea that was developed by, um, by Don Rubin uh, in the 1970s. And um, I actually, I think I, probably skipped uh, over some of the formula slides, but the, the, the basic idea is along the following lines. If you, if you have a data set with some gaps in it, some question marks, it makes it easier to analyze if you just fill those values in. 
maybe based on a model, could be like a, a regression model of predicting, uh, let's say that you have uh, uh, five variables, uh, x1, x2, x3, x4, and y. And let's say y is sometimes missing, but you want the mean of that y variable. And well, let's say y is income, and the x's uh, might include uh, uh, age, education, uh, gender, so some race, ethnicity could be an indicator, um, and you and um, and it might well be that the you, you know in advance that there's a correlation between education and income, and it might be that you also know just from looking at the data that the people for whom you have income observed have tend to have lower education on average than the people who had education is unobserved. So what you could do then is, is fill in values for those missing Ys, and then that makes the analysis a lot easier. You just then analyze the filled in values. The problem with that, it sounds like cheating because it is if you just fill in a single value because you don't know that that's the right value for the thing that you're missing. But if you do it more than once, and then you say, okay, well, the first time I got an average uh, uh, average income of $32,500, and the second time I got $33,100, and the third time I got $31,900, and you do it a, you know, a handful of times. Um, and each of those numbers, you know, based on your sample size, you would have a standard error for each of those numbers uh, that you could, within each of those data sets, you could have come up with a confidence interval or whatever for the, for the mean income. And, um, the, the framework of multiple imputation is that you combine two sources of uncertainty. There's this standard error from each data set, and it ends up uh, working out better to do it on the squared standard error scale. So you can, take, you can think of there being an average squared standard error uh, across those uh, of, the, of the, let's say you do it five times. So you have five data sets, five point estimates for the average income, five standard error. So you could have the average of the point estimates, that could be your overall point estimate. The average of the squared standard errors is kind of the, would be the average within imputation variability. But then you could also, there's this other component that you can just take the sample variance of the, uh, from the five data sets, you know, whatever I said, 32,500, 31,900. That's, there's some, there's some differences that, um, that reflect the uncertainty owing to the fact that this was one plausible set of missing values, this was another plausible set of missing values, that's capturing the uncertainty about the fact that you didn't know which values were, you know, the, the, you didn't observe those values. So if you, if you reflect your uncertainty about those uh, values by um, filling them in multiple times, multiple plausible values, that gives you a way to um, to, to do well, I guess maybe it would be f fair to say that your two broad goals would be incorporate the information that you have. That might be using the regression relation, like use, use the fact that you know education and income are related to predict income. But then also, don't exaggerate your precision. Don't pretend you know something that you don't know, and so you reflect your uncertainty in it. Um, so it's the, this multiple imputation framework. Once you have the framework, then the hard part of the problem is how do you impute the missing values? And that's in a sense what the whole, you know, the substance, the technical substance of the talk is about. It doesn't just work to impute the values any old way. If you just sort of make values up and then pretend, you could be just completely wrong. So you, so uh, the, concept there is that you want to take advantage of maybe uh, patterns of association that you've observed in the data, uh, correlations, uh, regression associations that um, might suggest that certain variables are predictive of certain other variables. And this, there's a, a more formal definition of the notion of proper imputations, but it's basically to say that the, the um, the average of the filled-in values and the, and the variability of the filled-in values are on target. Like you're not 
systematically overestimating or underestimating either the, the means or the variances. And so um, uh, there's um, you know, practical advice to include information, uh, include as many variables as possible when you're trying to do this, um, this uh, filling in. A, a, an anecdote on this uh, um, comes from, there was a um, series of papers in the 1980s in the journal of the American Statistical Association on um, uh, handling uh, missing wage and salary data from the current population survey, which is the survey that's used to estimate the unemployment rate in the United States. So it's a monthly survey of, at the time, I think it was 50 or 60,000 uh, households. I think it's even a little bit larger now. And um, although I don't know if it's going on during the government shutdown, maybe it's a, a month. Actually, probably, that's an interesting question. The, um, uh, uh, anyway, the, uh, um, there was a group that uh, was led by a guy at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, he was an economist. And oh, one of the other features of this study that was unusual, uh, you know, there's all this sensitivity now with like National Security Administration getting all of our information. There's a, there's a lot of sensitivity in government about uh, merging data sets across agency boundaries. And I worked at the Census Bureau, and they were, there was really a almost a fanaticism about, you know, being careful and making sure that you're honoring laws and pledges to, uh, reason, to uh, participants not to do that kind of thing. Uh, but there uh, are provisions that are, you know, required jumping through a number of hoops for, um, or at least there was back in the day, for, for um, merging data for research purposes. And so for this study, they had, um, current population survey data merged to internal revenue service data and social security administration data. So they had information on some of the income data for non-respondents to the survey. So that actually is an unusual circumstance that is very helpful for research purposes. And in that study, it was Greenlee's recent Zisheng 1982 or three in, in JAZA. And, um, they, they controlled for about a dozen variables uh, predicting the missing wage and salary data. And then, um, uh, and then they compared it to the IRS and Social Security data, and they found that there was still a bias. And so what they did instead is they used a method that uh, had been developed in economics called the selection model. If you've heard of James Heckman at University of Chicago, he won a Nobel Prize. In, economics. Uh, um, he and Rubin actually used to spar on a lot of issues, uh, including that one. Um, but anyway, and, and Rubin was actually the editor of Jazz at the time who accepted the paper, but he didn't like it. It's, it's an interesting story. Anyway, so he, um, uh, so, uh, um, so they went to this other approach, a selection model that basically assumes, um, well, income is skewed, so they didn't assume it was normal, but they assumed that the log of income was normal in the population, and so that when there was this bias, it was like uh, figuring that there were disproportionately numbers, disproportionate numbers of people missed in the upper tail or something would be kind of an issue. So then a few years later, there was another um, group where the key person, it was Rod Little, who wrote a textbook with Rubin on, on statistical analysis with missing data after this, after that point. And they had, it wasn't, wasn't the exact same data set, but it was the same structure data set. But instead of controlling for 12 variables, they controlled for like 25 variables, including some interaction terms, quadratic terms. And when they controlled for 25 variables, there was no longer this evidence of the bias in the, um, uh, you know, in the, in the imputed values. And so, um, uh, one of my, graduate school friends and colleagues, Joe Schaefer, had described that as uh, um, that, that uh, there's, an, there's a, uh, an assumption of uh, uh, ignorable non-response or missing at random that's a, that's a so-called relative assumption. It's, not, it's relative to what you're controlling for, and so you could allow the missing values to depend on other quantities that are observed, and then 
you know, whether that assumption is met or not depends on what you're controlling for. So the, the now finally back to this bullet point. Uh, if, if you control for more variables, it stands to reason that you might be, you know, reducing the bias in, in imputed values. And it also uh, might stand to reason that there's sort of less, uh, you know, there are fewer observed variables <laughs> that, that the, the missingness might depend on. So if you're controlling for all of those things, then uh, um, there's still a possibility that the missing values would de depend on something as yet unobserved or as yet uncontrolled for. But it's, you know, if you're uh, controlling for 25 things, it's, that assumption is more plausible than if you're only controlling for 12 things. That's a, kind of a theorem, isn't that, from probably yeah. we've learned that sometime along the way. Probably your class. So um, I, I describe an overarching goal. This is like, my, you know, my, my uh, you know, my uh, scientific dream is that one day we'll be able to take, you know, large complicated data sets, push a button and it'll solve our missing data problems uh, uh, by letting the computer, you know, uh, uh, gauge all the things that we would gauge if we were thinking hard about the problem. Um, uh, that hasn't happened yet, um, and uh, so, but when I think of general purpose multiple imputation procedures in a sense, that's uh, kind of what I have in mind and that, that could handle a lot of different flexible situations. Um, so I'm, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the, the main competitor, which in a sense is kind of the prevailing method of the day. So, so um, uh, packages like uh, Stata, um, there's uh, s some, uh, um, I'll, I'll go through some of the other uh, uh, packages that, there, that exist. There's one called um, IVE, where imputation invariance estimation software that's, uh, like some of these things you'd probably have to um, either, I don't know if I have the references for all of them here, but uh, putting IVE where into Google gets you right to that website. That's the, there's one called MICE, multiple imputation using chained equations that is um, at www.multiple-imputation.com. So that was, but that's, and that's a guy in um, Steph Van Buren who's uh, in the Netherlands who developed that. And there's a series of papers in statistics and medicine about it. And there's actually um, uh, Junaid Sadiq and Ofer Harrell have a package that um, has, has similarities to both of those. But the common theme among all of these that I've just mentioned is that they involve uh, handling the imputation one variable at a time. So you, let's say you have 10 variables, x1 through x10. You might start with x1, and if they're for values that are missing, you would do some kind of regression relationship of x1 on x2 through x10, or it could be uh, what, what Junaid Sadiq and Ofer Harrell do is that they subdivide the um, cases into, into subgroups where, um, uh, where the, uh, um, once you identify a, a kind of an exchange, a, a good reference group for a given case, then you borrow the, the, a value from observed cases that look similar. That's called hot deck imputation. And so, um, but um, uh, so, um, uh, so this, that's this first method talked about hot deck based on predictive mean matching. So the, the game that you play is, um, let's say, let, let me stick with this x1 and the x2 through x10. So you have um, uh, um, some cases where you have all 10 variables observed. And using those cases, you fit the regression of x1 on x2 through x10. And then for the cases where you uh, don't have, well, for all of the cases, you can come up with a predicted value from the regression. You say, what, what would the predicted value have been using the x2 through x10 variables? What would the predicted value of x1 
have been. And you can do that both for the variables that where you've observed x1 and the variables where you haven't. And then if you group cases based on their predicted values, so it has a mix of cases where the, the values are observed and cases where the values are not observed. And when the values are not observed, you borrow one from the values that are observed. And you, you, so, so the logic is, uh, um, well, if you had a perfect, like if, uh, um, you know, you're looking for uh, an imputed value for a white male age 49 uh, who uh, um, has a degree in statistics or biostatistics, uh, you might look to another uh, white male age 49 with a degree in statistics or biostatistics, but well, maybe we don't have another one with quite the same age, but we have one who's pretty close in age right here, and so, and, and, uh, and we both have curly hair, you know, whatever, <laughs> you can say, all right, well, let's, <laughs> let's uh, um, uh, you know, for purposes of, uh, you know, Scott's about as close as you're gonna get to me, or I'm about as close as you're gonna get to Scott, and, and, and you could do it that way, and, uh, um, and uh, if you're only if you're only basing it on a couple of characteristics, then you might be able to find a perfect match for, you know, a, a female of the same age and a male of the same age. But when you start controlling for more and more characteristics, like if you had 10 characteristics, and they, even if they were all binary, two to the 10th is over 1,000. So you're, gonna, you're just not gonna have perfect matches on characteristics. So the, the um, clever idea was, oh, well, let's, uh, um, uh, do this predicted mean, and then we'll group the cases based on the predicted means. And so, um, um, part of part of what you're wanting to be careful about in this sort of situation is uh, that you don't want to have pregnant males in your data set, for example. So you don't want to be imputing values to people that that are implausible for them. And so, it, it, this is where the modeling matters and where, where, again, you want to control for as many characteristics as possible. Um, other, other approaches, um, these sequential regression approaches, uh, um, you, you might do the regression of x, uh, let's say there are three variables, I think sometimes this is the easy way to describe it. If, let's say x1 is continuous, x2 is binary, and x3 is a small count variable, like, you know, zero, one, two, three, maybe there are a few fours in the data. Um, that might be sex partners or something in, a, uh, in the last, you know, I don't know, some, sometimes in HIV research you have a lot of uh, prolific people, but maybe it would be sex partners in the last month or something like that it might be a relatively small count. Um, uh, so you could, produ you could impute x1 using a linear regression on x2 and x3. You could impute x2 using a logistic regression on x1 and x3. And then you could impute x3 based on a Poisson regression uh, or negative binomial regression on x1 and x2. And um, that method tends to work pretty well uh, in practice as far as we can tell. But um, uh, theoretically, there's something kind of funny about it because you might not be, you might not know that there really exists a joint uh, structure among people that has all of those as their conditional distributions. This is the sort of thing that maybe is, uh, and tends to get worried about more in, um, uh, you know, in a statistics, biostatistics curriculum, but it's, you know, scientifically, it's a concern if you were uh, wanting to um, claim that, you know, you're representing uncertainty about the missing values, but you're filling in the values in a way that kind of is the, where they're not all mutually compatible at some level for, for defining a joint model. So um, uh, here, here are the references. Uh, these, these actually have the... Um, I don't know, with, with this information and the, um, th these are actually the references that support them. So this IVE where this uh, uh, T.E. Raghunathan, uh, better known as Raghu, was actually a 
Um, I was a TA for him my first year of graduate school, so he's, and we're all kind of connected uh, in this realm. But he, he's, a, he's now the chair of biostatistics at Michigan, and, uh, um, and uh, this IVE where is a SAS-based uh, uh, set of macros for uh, filling values in. I alluded to mice, which is, um, uh, was originally developed in S+, plus and now is, I think, in R. ICE, now STATA actually has been, um, I think the most recent versions of STATA now have, they used to call it ICE, imputation using chained equations. That's this notion of the, 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 this chain of equations. That's like the linear regression, logistic regression, Poisson regression chain. Um, now I think the most recent version of STATA has, they call it MI, and within that there are different options that in include this chained equation approach. And this one called MIDAS is a, is a hot deck version of these same kinds of things. So instead of the filling in of the values being done using regression predictions, the filling in is done using borrowing values from other cases based on, um, uh, you know, based on, the pr on this like predicted mean matching approach. One of the things about hot deck imputation that's nice is that it, you're always, you, you always know that the imputed value is plausible for someone because you're getting it from someone, but um, it's also uh, kind of a more discretized uh, method. You were going to ask well, a comment? Just a general question mm -hmm. on sample sizes to carry out, you know, the multiple imputation of the hot deck reasonably, because it seems like if you're borrowing from other values, you need to yeah, that's a, it's a great question, it's a, and, and um, if you're doing the imputation properly, you should be able to do it regardless of sample size, but if you're doing it properly, the, um, it's kind of an issue of what's going on internal to the uh, program. Like if you, if you only had 20 observations, right. then, um, then there might be a lot of uncertainty about a regression coefficient. But when you, these, these uh, sequential regression methods, you're doing it iteratively. You're like filling in X1, then you're filling in X2, then you come back after you go cycle through, you come back to X1 and so forth. And if you're doing it properly, then, then if there is a lot of uncertainty from the, based on the fact that there's not a lot of data, that'll show up. And so um, uh, I remember a conversation with, uh, a uh, professional colleague uh, who, he, it was interesting, he's kind of negative. He's like, I kind of think of multiple imputation as just being like numerical integration. Like he was sort of like dissing multiple imputation. Like it's just, you know, you're just, all you're doing is averaging over your uncertainty. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly what you want to do in this problem. So it's, uh, um, uh, so some of those kinds of, one of the appeals, I think, of the method is that that kind of uh, issue can be can get addressed more or less automatically by um, you know it just it gets taken care of if you if you handle it properly. So the other general direction, and, and this is the work that I've tended to do with graduate students, are these joint modeling approaches, and and they're um, uh, like Juan Song's dissertation the prototype problem was suppose you have, there, suppose all the variables are continuous and you have uh, only a hundred observations and you have a hundred variables. So if you were writing it down as a, there would be a mean vector that was a hundred elements long and then there would be a, a, a variance, covariance matrix with a, a hundred variances and then there would be a hundred choose two, which is like close to 5,000 covariances or correlations. Like if you think of each variable having a correlation with each other variable, then you, you end up with an enormous number of parameters, way more than you can fit very reliably. So the method that we used was to use uh, a factor analysis idea. A lot of times when you have lots of variables, you say, oh, well, maybe it's not a hundred independent items, maybe it's a far smaller number of constructs, and, and 
Uh, usually in factor analysis, I mean, one of the main uses I've ever seen for factor analysis is to define new composite variables that would be like, you know, the average of these 10 items or the average of these five items. But um, uh, we were doing it without, um, without any emphasis on the interpretation of the newly formed variables. We were just trying to do it to, even though it's a more complicated model than, than the model that in some sense that says uh, um, each variable has a correlation with each other variable and it's a distinct correlation. I mean, in, in a sense, that's, that's a simple model to describe, but it has too many parameters to estimate well. And so the factor analysis version harder to describe, but it actually has fewer parameters to estimate, and so you could, you could actually, um, you could hope to make some progress uh, in these problems, even if you had, you could hope to make progress even in settings where you had more variables than observations, because you could say, well, it's, you might have uh, 50 observations and 100 variables, but if I assume it's just five factors, then we can maybe do something with that. Um, uh, the, the fitting of these <coughs> kinds of models that include multivariate normal, uh, multinomial with log linear model structure, a general location model has a mix of continuous and categorical variables where the, uh, the, the means are allowed to differ. So you have a, a contingency table and then you have uh, means in each of the cells of the contingency table that are allowed to vary, but the variances are assumed to be the same across the cells. That's, um, you know, in that normal theory framework. And the, um, uh, really the, the one variable at a time approach is kind of followed from this general strategy where you, um, because uh, the method of fitting these models uses when it, the reference to MCMC is Markov Chain Monte Carlo. It's an iterative simulation uh, strategy that's a powerful tool for estimation in uh, complicated models. So um, some comments from experience. Uh, how are we going on time? Um, I'm not going, I'm going to have to breeze through or gloss over some of the technical detail. I think it's probably good to focus on some of the general themes here. Um, this theoretical foundation for the joint modeling approaches is appealing. It's, you have more, like if you, if it, you're, you're more sure of yourself about uh, the correctness of the estimation procedure than you are when you aren't sure that there really is a joint model that corresponds to the, all those conditional distributions. But it's, it's very difficult technically. Some of you end up with these problems with like 100 observations and 100 variables. Um, another comment, and this is a couple of studies that I did uh, here actually that were in, um, anchored in work in Ken Wells's center. The first one was a study that was a, a survey of uh, schizophrenic patients. And, um, uh, and we said, it, we, it was one of these unusual cir circumstances where for, we had some follow-up on some of the initial non-respondents. But we did the imputations as if we didn't know what those values were, and then we compared how we did. And um, so we, had, we said, okay, we've got 16 categorical, they were all binary variables, and 18 continuous variables. And uh, let's see how we do with the imputations. It turned out that the imputation of the continuously scaled values wasn't so bad, but the, the binary ones in that, uh, for, there's a reason why in high dimensional space, the, you, you ended up with predictions that were too precise. So it was as if it was saying that, you know, uh, this is almost certainly a, a zero, or this is almost certainly a one. And the reason that that was happening really was that um, like if you think of uh, there being two normal distributions that hardly overlap and, and then you observe a value, it's sort of, you know, more likely to be from one of those normal distributions than the other. And in, in higher dimensional spaces, that problem comes up more than in a, like a one variable problem. So um, uh, this other one with uh, Ling Chi Tang and Juan Song was on that. 
project too. Um, we, we were taking um, uh, data that was actually f originally from um, a study by Jurgen Unitzer, the impact project that was a, um, uh, and it had, some of the variables were things like number of clinic visits that were skewed. And, um, and we even allowed the model-based procedures, we allowed for things like do a pre-processing transformation, transform the variable first to make it look more normal, then do the imputation, then transform back. And even when we allowed ourselves that kind of flexibility, um, the hot deck procedures for those non-normally distributed variables tended to do better because, you know, it might not be very easy to find a transformation that works perfectly in that context. Um, what do I say here? Uh, some of the features of the applied settings don't always meld easily with familiar distributional assumptions. Uh, like um, the, the model might not know that it's a, a study of adults, and so you could end up with an imputed age of 16. You could say, okay, well, we'll round the age to 18, but then you have a spike of 18-year-olds, which might not be that big a deal unless you're doing a study of 18 to 21-year-olds, and then, uh, then you're looking at a subset of the data and becomes a bigger portion of the problem. Um, and uh, my, my favorite example of that was one of our first applications of uh, multiple imputation. We were TAs for a class where there was a gal who um, got in a car accident and only made it to the last 20 minutes of the second midterm exam. We said, oh, why don't we just treat her, her second midterm exam as missing data and see what happens. And, <laughs> And it turned out the mean on the second midterm was about 70, and so, and it was this iterative simulation routine, and so and Joe Schaefer was also in the class. This, this was his thesis project. And so the, the imputation program, so we were letting it run, and it runs, and the first imputation comes in 71. We're like, oh, that's plausible. It's kind of right near the mean, and then the second imputation comes after a while, 72. And we're like, oh, wow, this is great. It's like really precise. And then the, then the goes for a while longer, the third imputation comes, it's 103. <laughs> so, so it's like out of range because, you know, nobody told the program it can't be greater than 100. So that was a little like that first one. And, um, you know, we looked at, uh, um, sometimes you do, th you know, uh, um, the things that if they, if they work well, like that, I, I said earlier how that, method for binary data with lots of variables didn't work that well, but so we thought, oh, well, what if we just uh, impute on a continuous scale and then round the values to zero or one? And you can actually, that, that actually worked a little better than the other the general location model. Um, so strategies for dealing with high dimensional data that might be sort of more technical strategies, or what well, this, this isn't very technical, delete <laughs> variables. If you have 100 variables, oh, I can't handle 100 variables, I can handle 10. Okay, well, we'll get rid of 90 of the variables and stuff. And you can actually, you know, do things 10 variables at a time and make some progress. There, there's uh, um, options in most of these programs include that for um, uh, incorporating prior information and, and this, uh, so-called ridge prior, if you've heard of ridge regression, it's the idea, like, if you, if you um, have 20 observations and, um, and uh, 14 predictor variables, you can fit a least squares regression, but the, you'll have huge variance inflation factors, right? So this ridge regression is a way of stabilizing the estimations so that you add something to the diagonal of the covariance matrix that represents like the information content of a few observations, but it makes it, and it's, and it, no longer do the, are the estimates unbiased. There's a slight but unpredictable biases that enter into the estimates, but it stabilizes. So it's a, uh, people talk in statistics about bias variance trade-offs. And this is a situation where you might accept a little bias for a substantial reduction in variance. And so you can use that idea to handle these high dimensional problems to, to stabilize the estimation. 
there's this approach that I talked about of the factor model restrictions. That's another general strategy. Um, and uh, I only have about 10 minutes left, but maybe I'll sketch um, um, what we did, uh, um, these latent variable models. So this was, um, uh, so like the Juwan Song's dissertation work that we thought was pretty successful, and then the issue came up, well, what if you're dealing with, um, like you have uh, longitudinal binary outcomes. One of the examples here was from a, a suicide prevention study that Mary Jane did where the, um, uh, at each of, at like every six months, you had an indicator for uh, whether the person had suicidal ideation. And you might, might be reasonable to expect that there's correlation or some association for within a person between you know what their value was at six months and 12 months and 18 months and so um, uh, kind of the key technical step to handle that um, uh, issue was um, figuring out how to sample correlation matrices in these um, in these Markov chain Monte Carlo procedures so there's a, this connection between the scientific problems you're trying to solve dealing with correlated binary data and, and the statistical computing problems you're, you need to solve, in this case, uh, sampling correlation matrices in, a, um, in an MCMC problem. So um, the, the, um, the, the, just to sort of characterize the models, the so-called so multi, uh, multivariate probit model uh, you might have heard of a probit regression model. That's like if you have a binary outcome, you think of there being conceptually underlying that binary outcome, there's some continuously scaled latent but unobserved quantity that's a normally distributed quantity. And, the, and, the, uh, um, and there, you might fix the variance at one just to um, make the model identifiable, but you could let the mean vary. So like if the proportion of ones is higher, then the mean might be greater than zero. If the proportion of ones is lower, the mean might be less than zero. And the, and the, the, the concept might be if you, if you observe an observation that's greater than zero on the latent variable scale, then the thing that you absolutely actually observe, the outcome, would be a one. Else, it would be a zero. And this multivariate probe model is a, is a generalization of that where instead of there just being a single dimension latent variable that you see whether it's greater than zero, you have a, a vector of variables and, uh, and a covariance matrix with correlations between, um, you, you have a correlation matrix really to make the model identifiable. So there are correlations between the variables and um, uh, and uh, on each component of this, you might say, if that component is greater than, if the latent variable is greater than zero, then the observed quantity would be one, else the observed quantity would be zero. And so this is a, a, a model that uh, gives a lot of flexibility for modeling uh, longitudinal or clustered binary data. It also, can, you can have more than one cut point and use it for ordinal data as well. Um, there's another uh, idea that uh, was developed originally in economics, the multinomial probit model. So we, we got into these situations with race ethnicity, classic nominal categorical mm -hmm. variable, where you would say, how would you impute that if it was missing? And you could say, well, let's first do a logistic regression on whether the person is African American or not. And if they're not, then among those people will do a logistic regression of whether they're Hispanic or not. And if they're not, then we'll do a logistic regression of whether they're American Indian or not. And if they're not, then we'll do whether they're Asian or not. And then if not, we'll impute uh, Caucasian, let's say, or whatever, however many steps you want to go down that path. But the catch is that you'll get a different answer depending upon which order you enter those variables. So. This is an approach that's based on, like in economics, um, 
choices are what might be viewed as nominal you know, like decisions about you know, what to do in the marketplace might be regarded as nominal choices. And there are latent utilities associated with each of them. So if you, if you have k choices, you can frame that as having k minus 1 latent utilities where the utility of the last of the, of the kth group will be 0. And if all of the other utility values are less than 0, then the choice is take the, the reference group. Otherwise, take the maximum of the utilities of the other ones, and that's your choice. I mean, so it sort of fits with this economic choice theory conception. And you can use that in, um, and think of there being, you know, there are k race ethnicity categories. You could have k minus 1 and latent variables and, um, and do it that way. And so uh, um, that's also possible. This is uh, um, something about the um, statistical computing method that you need to accomplish that. I'm going to skip past that for this. But other than to say that once you solve that statistical computing problem, then it becomes um, easier to generalize this problem to having, like if you had multiple nominal categorical variables. So um, uh, here are a couple of illustrations. This is actually from the suicidal um, uh, suicide prevention program and the um, uh, so the way this study was done there was a standard procedures in the emergency room and then during the study they developed a videotape and so, so forth and they changed the protocol in the emergency room environment so that's the specialized intervention and um, like you can see in the first uh, um, row here, like at um, three months, these are the probability of suicidal ideation at three months. Like these, these intervals uh, um, don't overlap, so this might be kind of just barely significant. But you can see, you know, the predicted probability, it wasn't a huge sample size, it was like 75 in one group, 65 in another, so the effect is actually really quite dramatic. Uh, the, um, uh, the control group catches up a little bit so that, so that the differences don't look significant at 6 and 12 months. But that's an example of the kind of inference that you could end up with uh, after you do it. This one also is interesting. Um, uh, it's a, a study of uh, uh, following up breast abnormalities. So there was a, a breast cancer screening project and the, the goal is to see if the person will go back for screening afterwards. And um, if you um, uh, only use three of the variables, then you have like something like 1,300 complete cases. But if you use all six of these variables, you only have 314 complete cases, and the certain interactions aren't estimable, and uh, and so you're and you're throwing away a lot of data. So, um, whoops. Uh, What's going on? Did I turn this off? Um, stuck. Is that my? Oh, there. Okay, good. Um, I guess the main thing to that I wanted to show here. This is the um, estimated correlation matrix. And most of these correlations are small, but this is the correlation on the latent variable scale between the latent variable for what the language spoken at home was, Spanish or not, so there's some underlying continuous variable capturing that, and the latent variable for ethnicity. Well, it makes sense those would be correlated. So the, Im the imputations that you're filling in, you're not going to have it's, it, this, this is really getting at the pregnant male problem, but you're, so when you, when, when you impute um, uh, Spanish spoken at home, you're going to be imputing Hispanic ethnicity much more often. That's the kind of thing that you're um, angling towards here. Uh, and then you can do this, you can mix the data types. It becomes sort of just expanding the problem. Um, and my recent student, Ren He, uh, 
was you know, mixing continuous and binary variables. So I'll close with um, uh, a few comments. Uh, these latent variable strategies um, uh, provide you know, a direction for, for, that we can move in for doing these joint models. Um, uh, there's a lot of room for more progress, so that's good for those of us who want to stay employed as professors at UCLA. Um, uh, there's a question about whether these joint modeling approaches for all the work that they take, is it really worth it? And, and so in practice, I actually still often recommend to people to use these one variable at a time methods because they, um, you can get farther faster and they're pretty well accepted. Uh, it's just that, you know, it's maybe not the perfect uh, solution. And uh, that's, uh, um, we might even after a lot of work find the one variable at a time methods are per perform at least as well. But I, I, I tend to think that uh, in the long run uh, there will be uh, this joint modeling approach is uh, still has much to recommend it. So maybe I'll stop there. Okay.